We're having a temporary delay here in our transmission of this week's program of Meet the Press, the news conference whose guest tonight is the Israeli ambassador to the United Nations, Abe Iban. In a moment, our circuits will be completed, and we'll be able to bring you this regular feature of Sunday Night Monitor, the Meet the Press program produced by Lawrence E. Spivak. Welcome once again to Meet the Press. This week, the State of Israel celebrated the 11th anniversary of independence and the 10th anniversary of her admission to the United Nations. Our guest is Ambassador Abba Iban, who played a leading part in this fight for independence. During these 11 years, Israel has engaged in a struggle for survival against the threats of her Arab neighbors and the spread of communist influence in the Middle East. Ambassador Ebon is now completing his mission in the United States and in Washington. He is returning to Israel to become a candidate for Parliament. He was barely 33 years old when he came to this country to plead the cause of independence before the United Nations. Ambassador Ebon was born in South Africa, educated in England. Before entering the diplomatic service, he was a teacher at Cambridge University. He's an authority on the culture and the language of the Middle East. And now seated around the press table, ready to interview Ambassador Ebon, are Peter Lissagor of the Chicago Daily News, Pauline Frederick of NBC News, John Steele of Time Magazine, and Lawrence E. Spivak, our regular member of the Meet the Press panel. Now, Mr. Ambassador, if you're ready, sir, we'll start the questions with Mr. Spivak. Mr. Ambassador, there are many diplomats in Washington who think that the Soviet Union is really interested at the present time in the Middle East rather than Berlin, and that Berlin is just a diversion. What's your opinion of that? Uh, I believe, Mr. Spivak, that the European crisis is the central issue in international life today. It is in Europe that the atomic powers confront each other in a direct clash of policy and of interest. The Iraqi situation is not a great power crisis at all. It is a clash between two impulses in Arab nationalism, Nasserism attempting to dominate and subvert Iraq and Iraq striving with varying success to preserve its integrity and its neutrality. Well, now, Mr. Ambassador, do you think that there can be a real relaxation of tension between the Soviet Union and the West unless there is some settlement uh, over the Middle East problems? I think, Mr. Spivak, that the relaxation, if it comes, is more likely to start the other way. If in the central issue of their inter-European relations, the United States and the Soviet Union could achieve harmony, the effects of that harmony would be apparent in the Middle East. Mr. Steele. Mr. Ambassador, is it true that you're returning home because you want to be the Israeli Jack Kennedy? Well, that's a very uh, question full of allusion and implications. Uh, No, I don't think that my ambitions are in any sense comparable to those of my friend Senator Kennedy. In any case, I prefer to determine my own career by my own uh, independent aspirations and hopes. Mr. Uh, Ambassador, on a more serious note, uh, is there a threat to your country in the new program of British arms shipments to Iraq? Well, we haven't made any comment at all on that new program. Uh, We're not quite clear what its dimensions are, and uh, we have neither said anything to approve it or to uh, oppose it. And I don't think we're going to abandon uh, that attitude of neutrality on this question. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, this comes, of course, after uh, a series of shipments by the Soviets of arms to uh, the Iraqis. What is the status of your own uh, request to this country for arms aid made about two years ago? Well, in the past two years, and especially in the last year, Israel has had much freer access uh, to arms which she purchases in various countries of the West. The United States is not the primary source of our supply, but the United States is one of the countries which does issue export licenses for defense equipment to Israel. And I should say that the embargo position that we faced two or three years ago no longer exists for Israel in her relations with the Western countries. The inhibiting factor for us is the crushing financial burden of our defense needs. Is there a a growing uh, disparity 
disadvantageous to your country in the shipments uh, of arms to other countries in your area? In terms of quantity, Mr. Steele, we are very heavily outnumbered. We try to compensate for this by securing the highest quality of arms that are possible and also by mobilizing the full resources of our manpower and trying to build up a superiority in the scientific application of our defensive resources. Would, would there be anything to be gained in this area by a complete arms embargo if one could be negotiated, just a freeze? Well, I think it's a very utopian prospect, uh, Mr. Steele. I can't imagine that at a time when the great powers are competing in the arms um, question in Europe and when the disarmament debate in the United Nations is, a, is at a deadlock, we shall get agreement uh, to abstain from the sending of arms to the Middle East. But we do believe, first, that there ought to be some equilibrium in the policies of great powers in selling arms to the Middle East. And second, if some agreement could be reached whereby a greater part of the resources of the area could be devoted to economic development, that would respond much more directly to the real needs of our region. Miss Frederick. Mr. Ambassador, do you think the smaller nation should be brought into the negotiations on Germany, or is that a responsibility solely for the big powers? Well, I think, Ms. Frederick, that of all the international issues of our times, the German question is that which belongs most specifically to the great powers. It is they who have responsibility in Europe by reason of the occupation which terminated the Second World War. The only way in which small powers could enter the arena in any way would be if the great powers decided to seek the assistance of the United Nations. It is in the United Nations that small powers reach the climax of such diplomatic capacity and influence as they have. That was my next question. Do you feel that this whole, quest uh, this whole uh, situation should be brought into the United Nations so that the smaller nations have some opportunity to express their views? I think if the four powers could reach agreement amongst themselves, all the other 78 members of the United Nations would breathe with relief and would not have any jurisdictional or other egocentric inhibitions about applauding the result. If they don't reach an agreement, I think that a recourse to the United Nations might well enter the mind of one or other of the great powers. What do you think the chances are for agreement today? Well, it's very hard to say on the basis of the opening gambit in what everybody expected was to be a very tense and harsh negotiation. At the moment, uh, very little progress seems to have been made. Mr. Lissagor. <clears throat> Mr. Ambassador, when you came out of the White House the other day after saying goodbye to President Eisenhower, <clears throat> you spoke of the tranquility in your area and expressed the hope that that tranquility would be a prolonged one. Is your opinion that of a man about to become a politician, or do you base it upon a diplomat's judgment that Arab hostility toward Israel is on the wane? Well, whatever the motives for my judgment um, are, Mr. Lissagor, my judgment is that uh, there is a greater tranquility than before. Uh, this originates from the Sinai and Suez expedition. Since that time, our frontiers have been relatively quiet. There has been freedom of maritime passage in the Gulf of Aqaba and the Straits of Tehran. There's been none of the constant haunting tension that used to cloud our lives a few years ago. And I hope that this tranquility will continue. If it does, it might become the prelude for a more affirmative effort to reach a settlement. Does that mean, Mr. Ambassador, that you are not greatly concerned about the uh, communist influences that we've been reading about in Iraq? We're concerned about the situation in Iraq in general, but uh, we don't diagnose that as being primarily a communist problem. There are really two schools of thought in Arab nationalism, that which upholds the separate independence and integrity of states, and this school of thought is assaulted by Nasserism, which is attempting to build up a kind of empire with only one center of jurisdiction, namely in Cairo, and we've had many Arab states resisting that expansionist movement. We've seen it in the case of Lebanon and of Jordan and of Tunis, and of Sudan, and now of Iraq. The Arab states do not wish to give up their separate independence. 
and to become the provinces of Cairo. Is it your judgment, then, that Iraq is not the, beyond the point of no return in falling into the communist camp, and that we, the free world, or it may still be salvaged as even a neutral? Yes, that would be a, a just description of what our diagnosis is. Now, could you say whether or not that neutrality augurs well or badly for Israel in its relations with the Arab states? This is primarily, Mr. Lissagor, a dispute between Arab states about the destiny of Arab nationalism, and we are external to that discussion. But on broader international grounds, I would say that Israel, and I think every member of the United Nations, has an interest in victory for the concept of the separate integrity and independence of states. If that principle is not upheld, then all the 82 members of the United Nations are threatened in a vital point of their security. Mr. Spivak. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, recently Alan Dulles, head of the Central Intelligence Agency, was quoted as saying that he considered the Iraq situation, and these were his words, the most dangerous in the world today. Am I to understand that you don't think this a very dangerous situation? Well, I'm still not sure whether that was an, an accurate report. Uh, I would say that we're not amongst the alarmists concerning Iraq. And as I said in answer to your first question, I don't believe that the Iraqi crisis can compare in its potentiality for good or evil with the central crisis of European security. Well, now, there, there are many uh, people in this country, and I think uh, uh, in other countries, who think it's wise for the West to support President Nasser as a counter to General Qasim and the communists in Iraq. What's your feeling about that? We think that would not be wise at all. The origin of the crisis in Iraq, as in all other recent crises in the Middle East, has been the attempt of the Nasser regime to undermine the integrity and the independence of those regimes. It is in reaction against this attempt to overthrow its integrity that the Iraqi government has made certain alliances and associations. Now, if that is correct, you must reach the conclusion that Nasserism is not the remedy. Nasserism is the disease. Nasser is the cause of the crisis, not the redeemer of the world from the effects of that crisis. Well, now, what do you think the effect on the world would be, however, if the communists did get control of Iraq? And there certainly seems to be a very distinct possibility that that might happen. I prefer to concentrate our view on the distinct possibility that Iraq will manage to preserve its independence. Well, Mr. Ambassador, uh, a minute ago you refused comment on the question of uh, uh, the British government sending of tanks and jet bombers to Iraq. However, there have been reports, uh, one I know in the New York Times, which said that Israel was informed in advance of this. Uh, isn't Israel taking a position when it doesn't protest this? Well, it is a fact that we have neither protested this nor approved it. Well, were you we informed? have been, we, uh, we do know about it now. I don't know whether we were informed in advance. That's a matter between the British government and ourselves, and I'm not responsible for that special sector of our international relations. I think there are very good reasons in international strategy and law uh, why Israel should not comment at this stage upon this matter. Well, but Mr. Ambassador, I don't mean to press you on this thing, but since you, since you don't comment, since the government, your government hasn't protested, aren't you accepting this and aren't you saying that you think it is a good idea for the British to help uh, Qasem counter both the communists and Nasser. Isn't that what you're saying? Well, I still think, Mr. Spivak, that there is a distinction between silence about a problem and, uh, and approval. I don't think that our silence should be interpreted one way or the other. All I can say is that it's a fact that the government of Israel has decided to be silent about that. I know that creates difficulties for you and for me, but that is our position. Particularly for you, not for me. Uh... <laughs> Well, as you Mr. see, I'm not, I'm not laboring under much difficulty. Mr. Steele. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, you said a moment ago that the situation uh, appeared to be becoming more tranquil in your section of the world. Uh, but we, we keep reading of indications of increased harassment of Israeli shipping through the Suez Canal. Are those reports false or are they correct? There are some reports that shipments from Israel in non-Israeli vessels are uh, being barred from use of the canal.
the uh, position with regard to non-Israeli vessels has been since the end of the Sinai campaign that they have on the whole passed through freely. There were two instances of interception a month or two ago. Against these we protested very strongly to the Security Council. There have since been one or two instances of free passage and now we are waiting to hear what uh, Mr. Hammerschult has to say after his efforts to elicit the views of the United Arab Republic but of far greater interest is our desire to see what actually happens, namely whether the traffic about to go through is allowed to go through freely or not. Well, uh, we are about to begin negotiations here for a resumption of aid to Egypt, which, as you know, was discontinued in 1956 after the canal crisis. Uh, would, would you like to see some kind of a provision in uh, any, aid, any new aid program we go into which would require free access through the canal for your shipping? Well, I don't know whether or not the United States uh, plans an aid program in uh, the United Arab Republic. I do know something of a plan by the World Bank to assist the broadening of the canal. Our view is that it would be most astonishing for the United Arab Republic to receive assistance, especially assistance in relation to the canal, at a time when it was violating the law of nations in respect of that canal. And we think it's legitimate for law-abiding governments to require Egypt to obey international law in the canal before they receive international assistance. Well, uh, that was not done, was it, in connection with the clearing of the canal? No, it should have been done. I think that was a paradox that the United Nations cleared the canal, which Egypt then operated in a manner conflicting with the law of the United Nations. Ms. Frederick. Mr. Ambassador, Adlai Stevenson's political campaigns in this country were called egghead. Have you any concern about the results of an egghead political campaign in Israel? Well, I think that there's been a rise in the prestige of uh, the intellectual in the last few years. Everywhere in the free world, I find the eggheads are throwing off their yokes. <laughs> I think that applies to uh, Israel as well as to the United States. I don't believe that um, coherence or a certain amount of literacy are disadvantages in a political aspirant, certainly not in Israel. What will be the main issues of your campaign? I think the issue of the Israeli election campaign will firstly be the past. Has the past decade been a period, as some of us think, of triumph, of almost miraculous recuperation, surmounting insuperable odds, or has it, as uh, some others say, been a story of dismal failure and mismanagement? That's one issue, and uh, I think world opinion has spoken with a certain force in favor of the first and affirmative appraisal of the past decade. Following from that will be the question whether the movements and the influences which have brought about this triumphant period in Israeli history should be brought to an end or should there be some radical change in the direction of our domestic or international policies. That is the issue as they seem to be shaping up. Uh, perhaps this is another issue that uh, will uh, be shaping up by that time. There's a dispatch from Amman Jordan today saying that the Arab nations have decided to have a summit meeting to halt, uh, try to halt, immigration from behind the Iron Curtain to Israel. Now, what can the Arabs attempt in an effort to halt such immigration, and what will be the response of Israel? Well, they certainly can't affect our policy in any way, because immigration into Israel is none of the business of any Arab government, just as the population problems of Arab governments are none of our business. I'm certain that your country would react very strongly against anybody outside telling you that your immigration policies were either too liberal or insufficiently liberal, so that our policy of the open gate will continue unreservedly, irrespective of whether Arab governments meet, either at the summit or in the plateau or in the valley. Soviet Premier Khrushchev said recently that it was possible that um, um, Jews would be allowed to emigrate from Russia to um, Israel in the near future. Can you tell us uh, what you know of that development, why it came about, and uh, what you expect the result to be? Well, we don't know anything at all except that there was a newspaper report concerning this remark by the Prime Minister of the Soviet Union, 
and I don't think that we would comment on anything that you would call a development unless we saw something actually happening in that respect. I believe Khrushchev also said that uh, some um, uh, immigrants to Israel from behind the Iron Curtain were now returning uh, to their homes, uh, to their places of origin again. Uh, have you any comment on that? Oh, yes, we've studied that position, and uh, we find that uh, the immigration flow is accompanied by a very small ebb. I don't believe that there has ever been a flow of immigration in history which has had such a small amount of ebb backward. It amounts to a few percentage, a few percent, both in the case of uh, immigrants from Africa and Asia and in the case of immigrants from Europe. And although we like uh, all the immigrants who come to stay and we are disquieted when some of them leave, the proportion of those who leave to those who stay is still so small that one cannot really call it a significant trend. Mr. Lissagor. Mr. Ambassador, a year ago about this time or a little later, uh, Khrushchev expressed an interest or seemed interested in a summit conference on the Middle East. Now it looks like we may be going to a summit conference this summer. Do you think it would be profitable to put the Middle East on that summit conference agenda? The Middle East, Mr. Lissagor, cannot have its affairs arranged by governments, however powerful, which are not in the Middle East itself. And a meeting of the great powers is not a substitute for the only thing that could bring about a settlement in the Middle East, which would be some meeting between Israel and her neighbors. Now, if the powers want to consult as to what they should do in the Middle East, uh, some possibility of greater abstinence in the supply of arms, not attempting to draw the Middle East into the orbit of the great power conflict, uh, this might uh, have a good effect, but whether they're anywhere near agreement on such things is a, a doubtful matter. Uh, on the question of your relations with your neighbors, Mr. Ambassador, your relations with other countries in Asia and Africa are very good, particularly Burma <coughs> and Ghana, to, to which countries you're sending technical aid, as I understand it. Uh, do you regard these relationships with countries that are in Asia and Africa as a suitable substitute for economic relations with your immediate neighbors in, uh, in the long run? Well, it is true that we are developing uh, very close relations with the newly emergent states of Asia, beginning with Burma, but also including Ceylon, Philippines, Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, and with countries of Africa, including Ghana, but also comprising Ethiopia, Liberia, Nigeria, and other of the territories of that continent. I think this is a very significant development indeed. The first meaning of it is that the peoples of Africa and Asia have rejected the Arab attitude and jurisprudence on Israel, reject the idea that Israel should be ostracized and boycotted, and for Israel it is an important consolation for the unfortunate fact that we have no diplomatic or economic relations with our immediate neighbors. And for the world as a whole, I think it's a very moving spectacle to see a little nation like Israel, herself recently liberated, already entering into such fruitful relations with other nations younger than herself. But despite all that, Mr. Ambassador, <coughs> isn't a first condition for stability in the area peace between Israel and its Arab neighbors? I think the position would be more stable, more fruitful, more hopeful if that peace settlement could be achieved. But if it cannot be achieved because of the Arab refusal to achieve it, there are very many constructive things that we can do in building our country, in developing its resources, and even in consolidating its international position. Mr. Steele. Mr. Ambassador, uh, the other evening you said that uh, your country had to be a rugged little country because so much attention, so much criticism and praise has been lavished on it. Now, you've been here 11 years, and pretty soon you won't be an ambassador. Why don't you put the shoe on the other foot and tell us what you find the most encouraging and the most discouraging uh, element uh, development in American life since you've been here? Well, I'm still the ambassador of Israel, and I, I must clothe myself in that uh, valor of which discretion is the better part. But I would say the most significant things that I see in America are firstly its growth from 140 million to over 170 million during the period of my service. Secondly, I see a country that uh, is experiencing a widening of its libertarian traditions. American democracy, I think, is expanding in its beneficent influence 
And thirdly, I see a nation which is fully alive to the responses and challenges of the scientific and technological age. Mr. Spivak. Mr. Ambassador, how would you like the West, and particularly the United States, to deal with NASA at this point? I think that the way the United States deals with Cairo should depend on how Cairo deals with the rights of other nations. I understand that the United States has normal diplomatic relations with Cairo. What we think with great passion is that no other nation should support that element of NASA's policy which rests upon the domination of other nations. I don't believe he should be supported in his efforts to win control or jurisdiction anywhere outside the frontiers of the United Arab Republic. You would not, however, support him in a fight against Qasim? I don't think he should be supported in any attempt to exercise jurisdiction for a single inch outside his frontiers. What happens in Iraq really is none, none of his business. And do you think it is none of the business of the West either? What happens in Iraq? I mean, it's none of his business in the sense that he is entitled to intervene against the wish of the government there. No, no, but, but it, what happens in Iraq seems to be the concern of other nations, though, it's including the, Israel. Oh, yes, it's the concern of other nations, but that concern shouldn't take the form of attempting to change the government there from outside. Mr. Ambassador, assuming the permanence of Israel's present borders, how large a maximum population do you think Israel can support and absorb? Uh, we see no uh, limit in immediate sight, Mr. Spivak. We don't believe that there is any direct relationship between the area of a country and the population that it can absorb. The area does not really fix the population. The population is a function of the commercial, scientific, economic energies that a country generates. If you look at Belgium and Holland and Switzerland, Mr. the United Ambassador, Kingdom, I'm you see the example that we uh, like to follow. I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to interrupt. Thank you very much, Ambassador Eben, for being with us. And monitors thanks to Ambassador Abba Eben and the members of the Meet the Press panel for a stimulating and enlightening half hour. Now, this is Ben Grauer on this sector of Monitor saying thank you and good night. This is Monitor, the NBC Weekend Radio Service.